The Aztecs by Nigel Davies Chapter 3 Obsidian Servant Itzcoatl acceded to the throne in 1426 following the demise of the luckless Chimal Popoca. His assumption of power hardly bears the stamp of a routine succession. If not an actual revolution, dramatic changes followed, both internal and external. The name Itzcoatl means Serpent of Obsidian. He was to live up to it. To the Mexicans, this hard black volcanic glass was the counterpart of iron in contemporary Europe. Apart from its many domestic uses, it provided the cutting edge to the warrior's club and the sharp head to the bowman's arrow. But in the trial of strength that was to come, subtle minds were as much required as keen blades. The obsidian serpent was aptly named. Itzcoatl as a ruler was ably seconded by two outstanding leaders, to such an extent that his government is sometimes described as a triumvirate. The first was Moctezuma Ilwikamina, who was to succeed him on the throne. The second was the latter's younger brother, Tlacaelel. He assumed the key title of Woman Snake, or Chihuacoat. This office was henceforth under Tlacaelel and his descendants to assume an importance second only to that of Tlatoani. Under this new government, Mexica policy, of late so submissive to the Tapanec interest, was reversed. The Tapanecs were not slow to perceive the change of course. They soon recognized the inflexible disposition of the new ruler, little content to govern his realm as a mere vassal, subservient to the whim of the Tapanec tyrant, Mashtla. They accordingly blockaded Tenochtitlan, posting guards on the approaches to the city. At the same time, they put their own people on a war footing, aware that open hostilities were approaching. Events were to prove their appreciation of the situation to be correct. On Itzkowat's accession, a speaker gave the usual homily on the duties of the Tlatoani to the gods and his obligation to protect the helpless and the aged. Have you perchance to let fall and destroy the state? Are you to let slip from your shoulders the load which has been placed upon them? Shall you allow the old people, the orphans, and the widows to perish? The city of Mexico Tenochtitlan rejoices and exults under your protection. She felt as a widow, but now her spouse and consort has been resuscitated, to come back to her and give her sustenance. My son, have you no fear for the burden of toil? And do not be sad, but remember that the God, whose form and likeness you represent, will favor and succor you. The orators on this occasion, not content with conventional phrases, advocated a generally warlike policy. Such harangues, however, tended to backfire since they created alarm within the ranks of the common people and despondency among certain of their leaders. But to the common people, seeing the valor and strength of the Tapanecs were afraid. Holding victory to be unattainable, they sought to deter the ruler and the other leaders giving vent to great cowardice and weakness, tears and tremors, and caused dismay to the king and to the lords. It was even proposed that the image of Huitzilopochtli should be delivered into the custody of the Tepanec ruler as a sign of submission. A heated discussion ensued, and the new woman snake, Blaka El, roused as such humiliating appeasement, spoke up. What is this proposition, O Mexicans? What are you doing? You are out of your minds. Be patient and calm, and let us take further counsel on this matter. Is there such cowardice among you that you have to go and mingle with those of the Azcapotzalco? The ruler himself now spoke. He decreed that it would be a betrayal to submit to the Tepanics. Instead, he would send a deputation to Azcapotzalco. At first, no one dared to volunteer. Finally, Placa El himself offered to undertake the dangerous mission. Few notions of diplomatic immunity prevailed in ancient Mexico, and an ambassador's role was hazardous. On this occasion, Itzcoatl actually promised to take care of Tlaca LL's family if he did not return. Tlaca LL accordingly made his way to Azcapotzalco, persuading the Tepanic guards to let him through their barriers. The ruler, Mashla, expressed astonishment that he should have arrived unharmed. 
Blanca LL re replied, excuse me, in a vein of rather feigned humility, begging that the tyrant should have pity on their old people and children and spare them the horrors of war. The latter replied that, while he himself was well disposed towards them, his people now harbored such feelings of hostility against the Mexica that he must first take counsel. Blanca LL should return another day for his reply. On a second visit to the Tapane capital, the ruler spoke as follows, My son, Blaka Elo, what will you that I should reply? Although I am king, those of my realm desire and wish to make war upon you. What can I do against them? Because if I show any disposition to counter them, I risk my own life and that of all my children. They are angry and enraged against yourselves and demand that you should be destroyed. Blaka Elel accordingly anointed the ruler's body, as if he were a dead man, placed feathers upon his head, and put a shield in one hand and a club in the other, thus making a formal declaration of war. This time-honored ritual was normally to be repeated whenever the Mechica initiated hostilities. Though not specifically mentioned on this occasion, it was usual to let pass three periods of twenty days, involving a further series of visits and ceremonies, before the start of actual warfare. In the final analysis, the outcome was decided by the gods and success depended upon their favor, not to be secured by surprise attacks or unorthodox tactics, but by the strictest conformity to their prescribed rights. After this formal declaration, Blaka LL's return journey was even more perilous. The Tapanic ruler rather considerately suggested that he should leave the palace by a hole in the wall to escape his own irate subjects. He finally got home, after extricating himself from a band of infuriated Tepanics. At this point, with war imminent, the people of Tenochtitlan reportedly took deeper fright. Many even wanted to flee the city. Another heated discussion arose among the leaders, the faint-hearted making the usual appeals to spare the women and children, to pity the aged and defenseless. It was an argument in which the young and adventurous were pitted against the old and timid. The lords, that is to say, the nobles, seconded by the warriors, wanted war. The commoners preferred peace. Glaka LL made for his customary appeal for courage, and finally a most singular bargain was struck. The lords agreed. If we are unsuccessful in our undertaking, we will place ourselves in your hands that our bodies may sustain you, and you may thus take your vengeance and devour us in dirty and broken pots. The people in their turn replied, and thus we pledge ourselves, if you should succeed in your undertaking, to serve you and pay tribute, and be your laborers and build your houses, and to serve you as our true lords. Foremost in statecraft as in war, the two brothers Moctezuma and Tlaka Elel are invariably depicted as playing a leading role in events. The more orthodox accounts at times even convey the surprising impression that Itzkoa was little more than a weakling, only induced to stand up and fight by the indomitable Tlaka El El. Moctezuma also, the next ruler, is sometimes depicted as a mere pawn in his brother's hands. In fact, starting with Itzkoat, a whole series of five rulers over a period of some 60 years are often made to appear like the Merovingian monarchs of France, manipulated like puppets by this all-powerful mayor of the place, Tlaka El El. However, other chroniclers, such as Torquemada, go to the opposite extreme and simply deny that Blaka LL ever existed, maintaining that he really was one and the same person as Moctezuma. Other accounts mention him only briefly or not at all. Certain modern commentators, true to the first of these opposing versions, have tended to see in Blaka LL's office of Jiwakuat or woman snake, a counterpart to that of the ruler, implying a kind of dual government as existed in certain other cities. Some even write of Tlaka LL as the true founder of the Aztec Empire. This is probably an exaggeration. Itzcoat was 46 when he ascended the throne, and was unquestionably a senior commander and a brave man. Equally, his successor, Moctezuma, was an outstanding ruler. Suggestions of Tlaka LL's predominance over men of such caliber may have stemmed from the records of Tlaka LL's own descendants. It was not uncommon for later chroniclers to extol the preeminence of their own ancestors. 
On the other hand, in view of all the available details of the life and genealogy of the great woman snake, it appears equally incorrect to take the opposed view and to deny his existence altogether. It would seem most probable that Blanca Elil did exist as a historic personage, and as such, he played an outstanding part in events that were to follow, a service for which he was forever honored. The reign of his brother Moctezuma offered ample scope for statesmanship and military talent, and Tlaka LL continued to play a distinguished, though not exclusive role, in guiding the destinies of the new empire. He even survived, as will later be seen, into the reign of Moctezuma's successor. It is now necessary to retrace our steps to a point some nine years previous, well before the death of Tesosomoc. At this stage, two quite separate stories have been told. The one refers to the Mexica and the other to the Texcocoans. Their courses may run parallel, but their stories are still distinct and do not become merged until later, at the point where the two peoples combine to fight the Tepanecs. Until they actually join forces, it is unavoidable to treat separately the actions of the Texcocans and their young ruler Nesahuacoyot on the, on the one hand, and those of the Mexica on the other. Nesahuacoyot, in 1418, was the boy who had perched in a tree, a helpless witness to the butchering of his father by the Tepanex henchmen. After the, Te the Texcocan War, his kingdom had been divided between the Tepanex and the Mexica. He therefore had little cause to love the latter. Nesahuacoyot was an outstanding historical figure. It is not, therefore, surprising that his early life as a fugitive came to be told as kind of a saga, unique in the annals of ancient Mexico, and handed down by word of mouth and in pictorial records from one generation to another. After the death of his father, the young prince, accompanied by his brother and by his loyal follower, Coyoa, followed a torturous route as they fled from the Tepanex. They eventually reached the lands of their friends that lay beyond the great volcanoes, the Tlaxcalans and the Huachotzingans. Some four years later, in 1422, through the intervention of Nesahuacoyot's aunt, his mother was a Mexica princess, he was permitted to live in Tenochtitlan, but was confined within the bounds of the city on pain of death. During these formative years of his life, he was to be most closely associated with Itzcoat, not yet as ruler, but already a, a leading figure. In spite of bitter memories of former wrongs, Nesahuacoyot probably emerged from this period in Tenochtitlan almost as much Mexica in outlook as, as Texcocan. It was a measure of his greatness as a man that he was able to bury past differences and unite with his former persecutors in order to recover his lost kingdom. Nesahuacoyot now captured his first prisoners under the guidance of Goyowa, an important step in the life of a young warrior. Meanwhile, Nesahua Coyote lived and grew, and as he reached manhood, he took prisoners with the aid of others. On the second occasion, this occurred in Zacatlan. Then he came to Tenochtitlan. He dared to come, and he duly arrived. He then visited Desosomoc to deliver him his captives. Oh, show your lot, my lord. O Tetzosomoc, a fatherless orphan, enters your presence to make his offering. However much he yearned for revenge, it was necessary for him to seek the goodwill of the Tepanec ruler. His wooing of Tetzosomoc was so successful that in 1424 he was finally permitted to return to, to Texcoco and establish himself there. However, only some smaller places were returned to him, and he enjoyed no sovereign power. Moreover, he was not to be left in peace for long. Tesosomoc had now grown very old and capricious. The tyrant Tesosomoc was the most cruel man who ever lived, proud, warlike, and domineering. And he was so old, according to what appears in the histories, and to what elderly princes have told me, that they carried him about like a child swatted in feathers and soft skins. They always took him out into the sun to warm him up, and at night he slept between two great braziers, and he never withdrew from their glow because he lacked natural heat. And he was very temperate in his eating and drinking, and for this reason he lived so long. It was not long before the aged monarch had second thoughts about Nesahuacoyot. He sent for his companion Goyowa 
and told him that he had a most sinister dream. Listen, Goyowa, it is for this that they come to fetch you. I dreamed another thing that was truly evil, that an eagle came upon me, that a tiger came upon me, that a wolf came upon me, that a snake came upon me, huge, brightly colored, and very venomous. Goyowa, may it not be that Nesahua Koyoto destroys me. May it not be that he seeks out his, his father Ishlisochit and his uncle Jihua Kwekwetnot. May it not be that he himself resumes the war against my sons, lords, and princes. To ward off the peril, Desosomak tried to persuade Goyowa to kill his master. Evidently, he did not wish to appear openly responsible for his death and dropped gentle hints that perhaps the young prince should succumb to an accident. Goyowa, let his companions play with him. Perhaps they will pass by a river somewhere and they might kick and push him. Accidentally he might fall into the water. Or they could play together on a rooftop. Goyowa went back to Nesahua Koyot and told him what, a, what had occurred. Desosomok summoned Goyowa once more to his presence and offered him lavish presents of land if he would kill his master. He told the ruler that he could never do this. He would have to call Nesahua Koyot and do the deed himself. Shortly after this, the prince did go to Azcapotzalco, but Desosomak was already dead and he came to attend his funeral. He managed to escape death on this occasion, since the new Tepanek ruler, Mashla, considered it sacrilegious to commit murder during the funeral rites of his father. Following Desosomak's funeral, Mashla was not slow to implement his father's last injunctions regarding Nesahua Koyot. He first appointed a bastard brother of the latter as ruler of Teshkoko. He then adopted that well-tried ruse and his half-brother invited Nesahua Koyot to a banquet in order to kill him. Not surprisingly, the intended victim was forewarned and a young man of low extraction, carefully instructed to dress and behave as the prince, was sent in his place and duly assassinated. The messengers deputed to take his head to Mashla as proof of death would have a nasty shock. He, Nesahua Koyot, was meanwhile on the lookout. As soon as he knew of the death of the man who had been his representative, he embarked for the city of Mexico to congratulate his uncle Itzkowat on his recent election as ruler. And at dawn, he arrived at his palace and entered. Shortly after, Mashla's messengers arrived with the boys' head to inform of the death of Nesahua Koyot. The envoys, seeing him alive and well with his uncle, were astonished and petrified. He told them not to worry themselves with efforts to kill him, because the almighty and powerful deity had made him immortal. Indeed, so miraculous were Nesahua Koyot's many escapes from the jaws of death during this troubled period of existence that stories of his charmed life became a legend. And thus, many old natives would say that Nesahua Koyot was descended from the principal gods of the earth, and thus they held him to be immortal. And they were not wrong in saying that he was preceded, procreated by the gods, because Tezcatlipoca and Huitzilopochtli, the greatest of all, were his ancestors. From Tenochtitlan, he now returned to Texcoco, and Mashla again sent after him to have him killed. He welcomed the latter's henchmen with garlands of flowers. When they declared that they had come to play with him the ritual ball game, he invited them first to dine and feasted them lavishly. To reassure them during their banquet, he first sat upon his throne where they could all see him. At a well-chosen moment, however, he made his getaway through an escape hole provided by Koyowa and once more fled his native city. Mashla, infuriated by this latest deception, was now determined to track down his prey dead or alive and there was no limit to the rewards he was prepared to offer for the purpose. If his captor were a bachelor, he would receive a noble and beautiful wife and lands of his own regardless of his social standing. If on the other hand he was already married, he would be given numerous slaves in place of a wife. After further adventures, such as are apt to befall fugitive princes like Charles II, he had already once sought safety in a tree, he once again took refuge in the lands to the east of the volcanoes. He himself had wished to stay in Texcoco, 
but his trusted advisors warned that his forces were not yet sufficient to resist the tyrant. As he fled towards safety, he tried to persuade his followers to return to their homes. Go back to your houses and do not seek to die for me. Do not, for my sake, fall into disfavor with the tyrant and thus lose your homes and lands. Guatletnwatsin and Zontek Kochadsin and all the others replied that they only desired to follow him and die where he died. On hearing this, Nesahu Wakoyot was deeply moved and began to weep, together with all those who accompanied him. It was sunset when they finally crossed the mountains, and the rich valley of Puebla came into view, already obscured by the shadow of the great peaks, which now lay behind them to the east, west. Nesahu Wakoyot's first thought was to tell the ruler's envoys sent to greet him that they should kill him and claim the ransom. However, they insisted that he was now on friendly soil and that they would do all that lay in their power to further his cause. In the year 1428, Nesahu Wakoyot of Texcoco was again a victim of Tepanic persecution and once more a refugee beyond the mountains. Itzcoat of Tenochtitlan, his uncle, was equally in conflict with the new Tepanic ruler and already virtually besieged in his own capital. The inevitable outcome was the alliance of the Tepanex's two major victims, the Mexica and the Texcocans. Both parties were henceforth united in common enmity to their oppressor, Mashla. The Mexica were now governed by, the, by a dynamic regime eager to throw off the yoke of servitude. Nesahu Wakoyot, though militarily weak, was most firm in, in his resolve to wrest his ancestral possessions from the hands of his enemies. It was perhaps the Banek weakness more than their opponent's strength which caused the war. The conflict was partially triggered off by their dissensions, beginning even before the death of the aging Tesosomok. Sharp disagreements had previously arisen over the manner of treating the Mexica. These rifts were so deep that they apparently degenerated into a kind of civil war. The divisions were clearly accentuated by the controversial usurpation of Mashla, a man of violent disposition, with a talent for making enemies and losing friends. Personalities played a considerable part in the final outcome, and that of Mashla was unfortunate by all accounts. He may have begun to lose control of the situation even before the outbreak of hostilities. He went out of his way to provoke the Mexica. In particular, he complained that they had previously been relieved of tribute and pressed new demands for payment upon them. He clearly resented their enhanced status of recent years and sought to reduce them once more to their former servitude. His conduct contrasted sharply with that of his father, Desosomok, who was a past master in playing off one opponent against another, and who would never have antagonized the Mechica and the Texcocans at the same time. Had he been succeeded by a son of like caliber, the Tepanic Empire might have continued to expand and future historians would have had very little to say about the Mechica. But, faced by Mashla's provocation, the Mechica and the Texcocans automatically came together and the first stage was accomplished in the formation of the Triple Alliance of Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tacuba. At this point, it was more strictly a dual alliance since the part played by the dissidents Tepanex and Tacuba remained ill-defined. It was unlikely that the Mechica, aided only by Nesahu Wakoyot's limited forces, could prove a match for the Tepanex. It was therefore vital to secure the allegiance of the peoples of the Puebla Blascala Valley to the east. Since Tesosomoc had eliminated all rivals in the Valley of Mexico, there were no other major powers within striking distance. Accordingly, the attitude of Tlaxcala and Huesotzingo was likely to prove decisive. Any combination capable of defeating the Tepanex would probably have to include them. Of the two, Tlaxcala is better known to us simply from the part in which it played in the Spanish conquest. However, until about 50 years before that event, the major power of the region was not Tlaxcala but Huesotzingo to the south of it. In 1428, the latter was still in the process of forging for itself a small independent empire after a succession of forceful rulers had succeeded in subduing a number of neighboring cities. Nesahuacoyot was himself at this very moment in Huesotzingo 
after his recent escape from Texcoco. He was therefore ideally situated to secure the allegiance of that city. Moreover, a traditional friendship seems to have prevailed between his own dynasty and the Huashotzingans. This did not deter the Tapanek ruler from also sending a delegation to Wu Huashotzingo. No mention is made of Blaskala, though they also went to Chalco. They bore costly gifts of jewels, arms, and insignia. They were followed by a delegation from Tenochtitlan, complaining bitterly of the inequities of the Tepanics, or the in iniquities, excuse me. An embassy also arrived from Coatitlan, recently defeated and cruelly treated by Mashla, who had gone to the extreme of planting the city market with agaves and transferring the important center for slave dealing to Azcapotzalco, where it remained until the conquest. The latter brought modest presents, which was all they could afford. As a result, they were considered as of little consequence and were imprisoned with a view of being put to death. A reminder that the favors of the Huachotzingans were not to be had for the asking. Even Tlatelolco, as well as Tenochtitlan, sent its own delegation, complaining that the Tepanics had actually boasted of the number of rulers whom they had killed. The representatives of Tenochtitlan were led by Moctezuma, the ruler's nephew. Like the Tepanic delegation, he first went to Chalco, accompanied by a brother of Nesahua Coyote. But the people of Chalco so hated the Mexica that they would not hear of an alliance and imprison Moctezuma. However, like Nesahua Coyote, he seemed to enjoy a charmed life. He managed to escape and make his way to Huashotzingo. It was thus that the greatest of the Aztec emperors avoided an ignominious and premature end in a wooden cage in Chalco. He was later to prove the most implacable enemy of that place. In, in Huashotzingo itself, the issue between the rival contenders for favor still lay in the balance. The delegates pleaded their respective causes. Finally, how, however, those of Guatitlan, the paltry nature of their gifts now apparently forgotten, were released from their impending doom and brought out of captivity to testify. So terrible was their tale of Tepanic excesses that the envoys of the latter were taken out and publicly killed in front of the statue of the local patron deity. They were then cut to pieces with obsidian knives and thus became the first casualties of the war. As a result of Nezahua Coyote's appeals to Huashotzingo and Tlaxcala, they first helped him to reoccupy his own domains before rallying to the assistance of the beleaguered Mexica. This was only the first step in a slow process of reconquest. It was not until three years later, in 1431, that Nesahua Coyote was to regain full control of his possessions. In 1428, he returned to his native province, backed by these allied forces. Nesahua Coyote, in a lightning thrust, himself entered Texcoco while his friends occupied the neighboring centers of population. Mashla was so alarmed by his success that he made new efforts to appease Nesahua Coyote's subjects. Many accounts survive of the decisive happenings that now follow. In this instance, the Texcocan version seems to attain a greater measure of truth. The official Mexica sources pretend that it was they who fought the war single-handed. Neither Nesahua Coyote nor the Huashotzingans are even mentioned and any account which totally omits such important elements has to be treated with caution. With Texcoco subdued, the combined forces of Nesahua Coyote and his friends proceeded to answer the appeals of the Mexica, who were being besieged by Mashla in Tenochtitlan. They embarked in their canoes to attack Azcapotzalco, the Tepanic capital, which lay on the opposite side of the lagoon to Texcoco. When they reached the lake shore in front of the city, they found it to be fortified. Mashla was by this time so alarmed that he had abandoned the siege of Tenochtitlan and retreated to his own capital. The first move against Azcapotzalco was now made by the forces jointly commanded by Nesahua Coyote and the ruler of the Huashotzingo. They approached from the north. Nesahua Coyote had given the order to his men to leave aside their fine feathers and precious stones and to go into battle clad only in white cotton mantles. This was a most unorthodox instruction and caused dismay among the troops. It, in particular, it irked them to be outshone by the Mexica, 
who were not disposed to forego their accustomed sartorial display. Nesahua Coyote, however, always diplomat as well as warrior, addressed them as follows. I feel happy and amused to see you among such an array, brilliant with every color. It seems as if I was in a garden filled with a variety of flowers, and in which you, the fragrant blossoms of the jasmine, with no more adornment than a simple whiteness, are supreme among the blooms. External decorations do not increase the value of those who sport them, but that of the enemy, whose greed drives him to victory to obtain the spoil. Such an attitude to finery was hardly usual in ancient Mexico, and it may rather be a measure of the straits to which Texcoco had been reduced that its levies were not possessed of any. While Nesahua Coyote was making his southward advance, by a prearranged signal, the main forces of the Mexica made a frontal attack against the eastern defenses of the enemy's citadel. This assault, however, met the strongest resistance. Here occurred the hardest fight. The Mexica rolled back the enemy in their initial advance and made them withdraw a fair distance, capturing a wide and deep ditch constructed near a place called Petlacalco. However, the enemy turned against the Mexica with such fury that they drove them back over the captured trench and forced him to retire to the shore of the lagoon. Meanwhile, Moctezuma, on the left of these main forces, advanced from the south and took the Tapanic city of Tacuba without, entering, without encountering much, much resistance. Although it was well fortified, the ruler favored the allies. The main Mexica forces now renewed their assault on the eastern defenses of Azcapotzalco. They stormed the outer defense line from which they had previously been ejected and the Tepanecs fell back on their principal fortifications, consisting in a ring of earthworks surrounding the whole city. Night was now falling, and the Allied generals decided that the defenses were so formidable that they must invest the city rather than risk further losses by direct attacks. For this purpose, they divided their forces into four parts, and the Sahuacoyot swung round to occupy the western sector, the most dangerous, since behind him lay the heartland of the Tepanec domains, from whence he could be taken in the rear, while the Mexica forces under Tlaca Elo, Itzcoat, and Moctezuma blockaded Azcapotzalco from the north, east, and south, respectively. The siege lasted for several months. The Tapanecs made many sorties, while the besiegers in their turn tried to take the inner ring of forts. The fighting was inconclusive, with substantial losses on both sides. Those of the defenders were more serious, since they could not be made good by reinforcements. The Tepanec situation grew desperate after 114 days of siege, since the city was starving and their forces sadly depleted. Following a pressing appeal for help, a relieving force from other Tepanec cities approached Azcapotzalco from the northwest, while the besieged made a sortie in the same direction. After a fierce fight, the Tepanec general, Mazat, was felled by a blow on the head from a club. As in most Mexican battles, this settled the issue, and the rest of the army turned and fled. It only remained to drag forth the tyrant Mashla from his place of refuge in a steam bath and bring him to justice. And as Nesahua Coyote entered the city, the, the leaders of Azcapotzalco, seeing that they were lost, sought out their king, who went to hide in a Temazca which stood behind a garden and which is a bath. With many insults, they dragged him before Nesahua Coyote, saying that they brought him in order that the prince might do as he wished with him. They added that, had it not been for Mashla and his forebears, who had always been inclined towards tyranny, the state would not have suffered such wars and casualties. They said this and much else to Nesahua Coyote, who now had a great scaffold constructed in the square, on which he sentenced the culprit and killed him by his own hand. He cut out his heart and scattered his blood in the four directions. He then ordered that full honors should be paid to the body, and that it should be buried with all the solemnity pertaining to a great lord. In thus overthrowing the power of the Tepanecs, the Mexica and their allies had performed a feat that was remarkable, if not astonishing. Naturally, it was partly the fault of the Tepanecs themselves. The Mexica and Texcocans were subsequently to consolidate and expand this self-same empire, but on sounder lines. The latter almost invariably restored and protected vanquished local rulers. The Tepanecs, on the other hand, in order to satisfy their own dynastic ambitions, overthrew the princes and oppressed their subjects. One city in ancient Mexico could not long pursue a policy of domination 
unless it could augment its resources by the addition of reliable allies and vassals. To defeat Azcapotzalco had been a collective triumph. It was in this respect that Nezahuacoyol excelled. His greatest feat had been to enlist the support of Huachotzingo and its neighbors, without which the mighty Tepanex could never have been overcome. He was thus the principal architect of victory. A remarkable feat for a king still deprived of his kingdom and a general without large forces of his own. The, the Huachotzingans and their friends no doubt believed that they were simply redressing the balance of power too favorable to to the Tapanex. They were later to discover their great mistake. As will become clear, they were setting up the Machica as a far more hideous scourge for their own backs. For it was the latter who were the true beneficiaries of the victory, and who deserved their full share of credit. If Nesahu Wakoyot had been the architect of victory, the main instrument was the military genius of the Machica. This was not a fashion overnight, as some would suggest. After an argument between nobles and commoners on the eve of war, their army had been forged as a powerful weapon of offense over half a century of increasing achievement, admittedly under the Teponic Aegis, but as vassals growing ever more powerful and independent. Great successes usually come through the full use of opportunities, and in this case the Machica showed their talent. In the ever-changing kaleidoscope of Middle American politics, with its shifting pattern of alliances and its constant betrayals, it was they who doggedly pursued a consistent line, as the chosen few of Huisilopochtli. They always made use of any of valuable friends to achieve their own ends, and it was they who came out supreme. It had been a great feat to crush their masters. With the Tepanex once defeated, the world of ancient Mexico lay at their feet. We have already described the singular bargain whereby the privileges of the nobles would be enhanced or virtually eliminated, depending on the outcome of the war. Before their victory over the Tepanex, the Mechica, as their principal underlings, had acquired the use of some extra land. Such territory was, however, limited in comparison with the vast domains which they had so suddenly won. Whichever class or group controlled these would equally dominate the Mexican state. The actual distribution could hardly have been more inequitable from the point of view of the toiling masses. Indeed, the rather apocryphal story of the bargain may well have been inserted into the official record to, provi to provide some justification for such, dis for such disparate rewards to the few and to the many. By all accounts, the major share went to the nobility and warriors, and very little indeed to the clan organizations. Blaca Elo and Moctezuma between them took about as much land as went to the clans, each of which received a limited acreage for the upkeep of their temples. Private holdings of the land had probably existed previously, apart from those controlled by the ruler himself, but on a relatively modest scale. Now, however, the conquest of the Tepanek and other territories radically altered the balance. The proportion that was individually occupied increased out of all proportion. This private tenure was of two kinds. The first consisted of lands owned outright by a small and privileged class of nobles, the Pilis, or princes, of whom at least a fair proportion descended from the ruling dynasty. These were farmed by serfs, who were tied to the soil. Apart from such established private properties, a further major share of the total was, at least in theory, at the ruler's disposal, in the form of land held by leading warriors on a kind of life tenure. This was a recognized method of rewarding distinguished service. However, the occupation tended to become hereditary, if a suitable heir was available, and could win his spurs on the field of battle. In addition to such holdings of an individual nature, the state itself controlled various categories of land dedicated to the upkeep of the palace and its officials, the equivalent of a, of a modern government, to the maintenance of the temples, and to the expenses of war. Large tracts, of course, belonged to the ruler himself. Last but not least came the communal lands, Kapulali. Even if their proportion of the total had been reduced, their extent was considerable. The free men who formed them, Masewales, formed the backbone of the nation and furnished the rank and file of the armies. These tribal lands were inalienable, and a family would enjoy hereditary usufruct of its parcel, which was only redistributed if the user died without heirs. Tribute was paid to the ruler on such holdings. The organization of the soil, thus established, formed on the basis of which the Mexican state reposed. 
It was not merely the chief source of wealth, as in the ancient kingdoms of the old world. There was really no other form of durable property. The principal means of exchange, cacao beans and small mantles, were no lasting substitute for metal currency. Admittedly, small axe-shaped copper sheets and gold dust and quills were also used for monetary purposes in parts of Mexico. However, hoarding of these does not seem to have occurred on a large scale. Land holding thus provides the key to the social order. By taking the lion's share of the broad acres of the newly conquered, the ruler and nobles assured for themselves a firm basis of economic power, independent of the communal organizations. They were thus free to pursue their dreams of further conquest, unfettered by the fears or inhibitions of the masses. Whatever its original structure, the Mexican state was now in essence a tightly controlled oligarchy. At the top of the social pyramid was the ruler Tlatoani. He was always chosen from the same family and was usually a son or brother of his predecessor. He was advised in the first place by a council of four from the ranks of which his successor was normally chosen. These four councillors additionally played a major part in the choice of a new ruler, through, though elders and warriors, as well as the allied rulers of Texcoco and Tacuba, also took part in order to give added ceremony to the occasion. The key council of four members probably came into formal existence at the time of Itzcoat. Supreme power was thus very much concentrated in the hands of the royal family, to which the four councillors, as eligible to succeed to the throne, naturally belonged. There also existed a larger council, called the, the Tlatokan, variously described as having from 12 to 20 members. In addition, there was a war council to advise on military matters. Thus, as an elective monarch, assisted by different bodies, the Tlatoani was not absolute. However, his personal power tended to increase, owing to a gradual process of centralization culminating in the reign of Moctezuma I. In a state dedicated to conquest, the ruler must receive huge quantities of tribute, and his power will automatically be augmented at the expense of his subjects. Next below the Tlatoani in the social order, at one remove, stood the hereditary nobility. Restricted in numbers and perhaps mainly of royal descent, they were well endowed with land, but not on the vast scale of their European counterparts. Service to the state was obligatory, and they were expected to participate actively in war to justify the retention of their privileged position. In addition to this select few, a much larger upper or leading class existed. The distinguished warriors, based chiefly on meritorious service, in principle they enjoyed their rank and land for their own lifetime. Often however, such privileges tended to pass from father to son. Equally to be taken into account were the priests. They formed an important and numerous caste an intellectual elite more to be classed with the rulers than the rule. In some respects, they are hardly to be distinguished from the nobility, for the ruler himself was of priestly rank. They also went to war and took captives. The distinction between priests and warriors is not an absolute one. They performed the important additional task of educating the upper classes in the privileged schools, Kalmekak. The rest of the population went to what was virtually a college for military training, Teposhkali which existed in each clan. A smaller but significant group was the officials and judges. From the accounts of Sahagun and others, it can be seen that in Tenochtitlan, justice was meted out to rich and poor alike with severe impartiality. In addition to other special classes, there existed the merchants, whose position will later be discussed in more detail. They constituted a group apart and enjoyed many privileges, such as their own law courts. Below these favored sectors stood the common people. Of these, the most important category was the freemen, Masewales, who formed the basis of the clan organization. The relative lowliness of their situation was defined by rigorous sumptuary laws. Only the upper classes were permitted to wear cotton clothes or to drink cocoa. The elaborate attire, the fine jewels, and sumptuous food of the nobles were taboo for the people. The latter were unceremoniously killed if they dared to indulge in such luxuries. Next, as a group, came the serfs, bound to the nobles' hereditary lands. And the last of all were the slaves. The institution was less highly developed than in the old world, partly because prisoners of war were usually sacrificed. People lost their freedom chiefly as a consequence of certain crimes or of unpaid debts. 
men could voluntarily sell themselves into slavery, and they could be, and equally they could be redeemed by stipulated payment. Slaves were mainly used in domestic service and as carriers in the absence of pack animals. Unlike their old world counterparts, their children were not automatically born into the same condition. Thus, by the reign of Itzcoat, the Mexican state had developed elaborate institutions fully comparable in their sophistication to those of the ancient monarchies of the old world. Basically, the Mexican pol polity was a meritocracy, the ruler being supported by appointed functionaries as well as hereditary nobles. In theory, at least, such a situation continued to prevail. However, it was in a state of evolution. Like the others in the old world and elsewhere, it became increasingly centralized, reaching its culmination in the years before the Spanish conquest. At the same time, while the system of government was moving towards a greater degree of absolutism and privilege, it was still far from attaining that degree of social stratification that prevailed in contemporary Europe. The nobles only owned part of the land, and freemen could still attain high office. Marriage between freemen and nobles was even permitted. Equally, members of the ruling class could lose their status if their sons proved unworthy. For the privileged Mexicans, life was rigorous rather than, re than relaxed, and probably the insistence on self-denial and service goes far to account for their triumphs. The Mexican upper hierarchy seems to have been imbued with, with an ideal of dedication to the state that recalls the early Romans, and that made for a notable singleness of purpose. The vanished Stepanex the, had foundered upon the Rock of Discord, while the Machica invariably present, presented a united front. And on the whole, their oligarch the oligarchical constitution was to work admirably. The triple alliance that would jointly rule the Aztec Empire was formally constituted only after victory. The Aztec domains were, initially at least, neither solely conquered nor controlled by Tenochtitlan. To mark the final establishment of the alliance, Itzcoatl adopted the title of ruler of the Urwa, from whom the Mexica, of course, claimed their descent. Nesahuacoyo became ruler of the Alcolua, and the Senor of Tacuba was styled ruler of the Tepanex. The, the latter played a somewhat secondary role in the councils of the alliance, but it was nevertheless significant to include a living city of the defeated adversary. From now on, it becomes appropriate to make more frequent ter use the term of Aztec as the best way of describing the forces of an empire that was not solely either Mexican or Texcoquen. After the triumph of 1428, Itzcoatl continued to reign for a further 12 years. Nesahuacoyot, though a leading member of the victorious team, was not yet a master in his own house. Even according to Texcoquen services, he remained in Tenochtitlan for three years after victory was attained before he could win back his own kingdom. Notwithstanding his role in an overwhelmingly successful war, he had much difficulty with his own subjects many of whom had long since displayed pro tepanic sentiments. Now at last, with the help of his partner Itzcoat, he managed to come to terms with the various subject rulers of his province and agreed to restore them to their thrones. He immediately began to rebuild Texcoco, and Itzcoat helped in the task by providing artisans. The latter years of Itzcoat's reign were to witness the conquest of the remaining principalities of the Valley of Mexico. These included several tepanic centers, which inevitably fell a prey to the Mexicans once their leader had been overthrown. They made the fatal mistake of allowing themselves to be swallowed up one by one. The Tepanic city of Coyoacan was the first to be attacked, and the war began on the pretext that Mexican women had been molested and robbed. On this occasion, a final but futile attempt was made to unite the potential victims of the Aztecs into a coalition and to plan a joint defense. A conference took place in Chalco, but it soon became clear that no agreement could be reached to help Coyoacan. Perhaps those present were mindful of the wise words of Nesahuacoyot, who had also been approached and had declared that the Mexica were invincible because the god Huitzilopochtli was always at their side. At all events, the policy of divide and rule continued to prevail. There followed a curious incident in the war against Coyoacan. The rulers of the city invited the Mexica to a banquet. Itzcoat himself did not attend, but other leaders accepted their bidding, including his nephew Tlacaela. To their utter astonishment, they were ordered to don women's clothes and dance before the assembled Tepanex. Thus arrayed, 
They returned and presented themselves before Itzkowat, telling him how they had been mocked. An even odder form of retaliation was devised, equally disconcerting, if less insulting. And they did thus. They took a large quantity of cakes made of escawite, which are the red worms which grow in the mud of the lagoon and which are a special delicacy of the Mexicans, and threw them onto a fire together with ducks, fish, frogs, etc. And so great was the smoke which arose that it entered the streets of Coyoacan and made women miscarry from their sheer desire to eat what the Mexicans were cooking, while children pined away, clamoring for these delicacies. Subsequently, the battle was joined. It was an even fight. Subsequently, the battle, battle was joined. It was an even fight until the Mexicans turned the tide by a surprised flank attack. They thus won the day, but feeling ran high. Some of the inhabitants fled to other cities rather than face subject, subjugation to the Aztec yoke. However, Coyoacan continued to be a place of importance and later served as Cortez's provisional capital while the new city of Mexico was being built. As in the previous case of Azcalpotzalco, the conquered lands were distributed in most unequal proportions, the common people again receiving but a meager share. Even communal lands of, the, of Coyoacan were taken. It was perhaps an act of policy to soak the poor, but permit the nobles to retain their holdings in order to ensure their future loyalty to the empire. After Coyoacan, it was the turn, it was the turn of Xochimilco, whose people, had, as we have already seen, enjoyed a degree of kinship with the Mexica. However, as often happens in such cases, a long tradition of, of rivalry persisted, dating back to the days when the Mexica, during their captivity, had cut off the ears of the people of Xochimilco and accumulated them in baskets as an offering to their masters. This time, another pretext was chosen to pick a quarrel, the Mexica sending to request wood and stone from Xochimilco, which was which with which to build a temple. This was a customary manner of demanding token submission and the request was refused. The people of Xochimilco still ruled an important and rich territory and had a large army. However, they adopted a defensive strategy, sh shutting themselves in behind their barricades. Once once these were stormed, they promptly surrendered. It is clear that on this occasion the Michika were determined to remain on good terms with the vanquished. The troops were not permitted to pillage or even to enter the, the city. Itzcoat showed special favor to the ruler of Xochimilco, allowing him to eat in his presence. His subjects, however, had to pay for the war, and the victors took some lands. It was at this time that the great causeway was commenced, linking Coyoacan with the Nochtitlan across the lagoon. Labor from Xochimilco was used for the purpose. This constituted one of the three great arteries by which the Spaniards were later to assault the city. A similar attack was now made on, Cuit on Cuitlahuac. In this case, a new pretext was found. The Mexica made the unusual demand that maidens from noble families should come and dance in Tenochtitlan at the feast of Huitzilopochtli. The request, of course, indignantly rejected by the ruler. Mexicans, do you know what you are saying? Are my daughters, sisters, and relations, and those of the lords of Cuitlahuac mere toys or buffoons of your god, that they must sing and dance before him? Tell your lord Itzcoat that I do not hold in such low regard the girls of my city, even the most humble, that I may send them at his behest to act as jesters to his god." End quote. Cuitlahuac lay in the midst of the lagoon, and a combined military and naval operation had to be undertaken involving the use of fleets of canoes. The Machica levies must have formed a most impressive sight as they set forth upon the water. And when the canoes arrived, all the men of the army embarked and passed an arm of the lagoon, which had no causeway nor other means of passing and was fairly deep. And thus, as the Mexican army crossed and jumped out onto the land of Cuitlahuac, the people of that place came out against them all in canoes and very well arrayed with their rich and colorful insignia, the canoes themselves being adorned with shields and richly hued feathers with which the oarsmen were covered. And the fighting men were all very well armed and bedecked with feathers, white, red, yellow, blue, green, black, and every color, all with different plumes on their heads and backs. Round their necks they wore many jewels of gold set with stones, as well as bracelets of brilliant gold. 
and above their feet anklets of gold to complete the arms which they wore from head to foot. Shortly after the successful conclusion of this campaign, Itzcoat died. In 1440, after also reconquering Cuernavaca and neighboring cities. In addition, he is reported to have taken Tula, as well as certain places in the northern part of the modern state of Guerrero, though he did not campaign in this direction as far as the Pacific coast. The emphasis, however, in Itzcoat's reign had been placed mainly on the consolidation of the Valley of Mexico and contiguous areas, acquisitions which paved the way to the more far-reaching conquests of his successor. He had undoubtedly proved to be a notable ruler. His master stroke had been the overthrow of the Tepanecs and the formation of the Triple Alliance. Of importance also during his reign had been the consolidation of the Mexican state and of the machinery of government as an essential preliminary to further advances. This concludes chapter 3.